The Scholar Gypsy, 1853, is a poem by Matthew Arnold. Based on a 17th century Oxford story found in Joseph Glanville's The Vanity of Dogmatizing, 1661. It has often been called one of the best and most popular of Arnold's poems. The Original Story Arnold prefaces the poem with an extract from Glanville, which tells the story of an impoverished Oxford student who left his studies to join a band of gypsies, and so ingratiated himself with them that they told him many of the secrets of their trade. After some time he was discovered and recognized by two of his former Oxford associates, who learned from him that the gypsies had a traditional kind of learning among them, and could do wonders by the power of imagination, their fancy binding that of others. When he had learned everything that the gypsies could teach him, he said, he would leave them and give an account of these secrets to the world. Stanza 1. Go, for they call you, shepherd, from the hill. Go, shepherd, and untie the waddled coats. No longer leave thy wistful flock unfed. Nor let thy bawling fellows rack their throats. Nor the cropped herbage shoot another head. But when the fields are still, and the tired men and dogs all gone to rest, and only the white sheep are sometimes seen, cross and recross the strips of moon blanched green. Come, shepherd and again begin the quest. Here, where the reaper was at work of late, in this high field's dark corner, where he leaves, his coat, his basket, and his earthen cruise, and in the sun all morning binds the sheaves. Then here, at noon, comes back his stores to use. Here will I sit and wait, while to my ear from uplands far away, the bleeding of the folded flocks is born, with distant cries of reapers in the corn. All the live murmur of a summer's day. Screened is this nook o'er the high, half reaped field. And here till sundown, shepherd, will I be. Through the thick corn the scarlet poppies peep. And round green roots and yellowing stalks I see. Pale pink convolvulus in tendrils creep. And air swept lindens yield. Their scent, and rustle down their perfumed showers. Of bloom on the bent grass where I am laid and bower me from the August sun with shade, and the eye travels down to Oxford's towers. And near me on the grass lies Glanville's book. Come, let me read the oft read tale again. The story of the Oxford scholar poor, of pregnant parts and quick inventive brain, who, tired of knocking at preferment store, one summer morn forsook his friends, and went to learn the gypsy lore, and roamed the world with that wild brotherhood and came, as most men deemed, to little good, but came to Oxford and his friends no more. But once, years after, in the country lanes, two scholars, whom at college erst he knew, met him, and of his way of life inquired, whereat he answered, that the gypsy crew, his mates, had arts to rule as they desired, the workings of men's brains, and they can bind them to what thoughts they will. And I, he said, the secret of their art, when fully learned, will to the world impart. But it needs heaven sent moments for this skill. This said, he left them, and returned no more. But rumors hung about the countryside, that the lost scholar long was seen to stray, seen by rare glimpses, pensive and tongue tied, in hat of antique shape, and cloak of gray. The same the gypsies wore. Shepherds had met him on the Hurston Spring. At some lone alehouse in the Berkshire Moors, on the warm angle bench, the smock frocked boars had found him seated at their entering. But, mid their drink and clatter, he would fly. And I myself seem half to know thy looks, and put the shepherds, wanderer, on thy trace, and boys who in lone wheat fields scare the rooks. I ask if thou hast passed their quiet place, or in my boat I lie. Moored to the cool bank in the summer heats, mid wide grass meadows which the sunshine fills, and watch the warm, green muffled Cumner hills, and wonder if thou haunts their shy retreats. For most, I know, thou lovest retired ground. Thee at the fairy Oxford riders glide, returning home on summer nights, have met crossing the stripling Thames at Bablock Hith, trailing in the cool stream thy fingers wet.
as the punt's rope chops round, and leaning backward in a pensive dream, and fostering in thy lap a heap of flowers, plucked in shy fields and distant witchwood bowers, and thine eyes resting on the moonlit stream. And then they land, and thou art seen no more. Maidens, who from the distant hamlets come, to dance around the Fifield Elm in May. Oft through the darkening fields have seen thee roam, or cross a stile into the public way. Oft thou hast given them store of flowers, the frail leafed, white anemone, dark blue bells drenched with dews of summer eaves, and purple orchises with spotted leaves. But none hath word she can report of thee. And, above Godstow Bridge, when hay times here in June, and many a scythe in sunshine flames, Men who through those wide fields of breezy grass where black winged swallows haunt the glittering Thames, to bathe in the abandoned Lasher Pass, have often passed thee near, sitting upon the river bank overgrown. Mark thine outlandish garb, thy figure spare, thy dark vague eyes, and soft abstracted air. But, when they came from bathing, thou wast gone. At some lone homestead in the Cumner Hills, where at her open door the housewife darns, Thou hast been seen, or hanging on a gate, to watch the threshers in the mossy barns. Children, who early range these slopes and late, for cresses from the rails, have known the eyeing, all in April day, the springing pasture and the feeding kine. And mark thee, when the stars come out and shine, through the long dewy grass move slow away. In autumn, on the skirts of Bagley Wood, where most the gypsies by the turf edged way, Pitch their smoke tents, and every bush you see, with scarlet patches tagged and shreds of gray, above the forest ground called Thessaly. The blackbird, picking food, sees thee, nor stops his meal, nor fears at all. So often has he known thee past him stray, wrapped, twirling in thy hand a withered spray, and waiting for the spark from heaven to fall. And once, in winter, on the causeway chill, where home through flooded fields foot travelers go. Have I not passed thee on the wooden bridge, wrapped in thy cloak and battling with the snow? Thy face towered Hinksy in its wintry ridge, and thou hast climbed the hill, and gained the white brow of the Cumner Range, turned once to watch, while thick the snowflakes fall, the line of festal light in Christchurch Hall, then sought thy straw in some sequestered grange. But what, I dream? Two hundred years are flown since first thy story ran through Oxford halls, and the great Glanville did the tale inscribe that thou wert wandered from the studious walls to learn strange arts, and join a gypsy tribe. And thou from earth art gone. Long since, and in some quiet churchyard laid. Some country nook, where were thy unknown grave. Tall grasses and white flowering nettles wave. Under a dark, red-fruited yew tree's shade. No, no. Thou hast not felt the lapse of hours. For what wears out the life of mortal men? Tis that from change to change their being rolls. Tis that repeated shocks, again, again. Exhaust the energy of strongest souls. And numb the elastic powers. Till having used our nerves with bliss and teen. And tired upon a thousand schemes our wit. To the just pausing genius we remit. Our worn out life, and are, what we have been. Thou hast not lived, why shouldst thou perish, so? Thou hast one aim, one business, one desire, else wert thou long since numbered with the dead, else hadst thou spent, like other men, thy fire. The generations of thy peers are fled, and we ourselves shall go. But thou possessest an immortal lot, and we imagine thee exempt from age, and living as thou livest on Glanville's page, because thou hadst, what we, alas, have not. For early didst thou leave the world, with powers. Fresh, undiverted to the world without. Firm to their mark, not spent on other things. Free from the sick fatigue, the languid doubt. Which much to have tried, in much been baffled, brings. All life unlike to ours. Who fluctuate idly without term or scope. Of whom each strives, nor knows for what he strives. And each half lives a hundred different lives. Who wait like thee but not, like thee, in hope. Thou waitest for the spark from heaven, and we, light half-believers of our casual creeds, who never deeply felt, nor clearly willed, whose insight never has borne fruit in deeds, 
whose vague resolves never have been fulfilled. For whom each year we say, breeds new beginnings, disappointments new. Who hesitate and falter life away, and lose tomorrow the ground won today. Ah, do not we, wanderer, await it too? Yes, we await it, but it still delays. And then we suffer, and amongst us one, who most has suffered, takes dejectedly his seat upon the intellectual throne, and all his store of sad experience he lays bare of wretched days, tells us his misery's birth and growth and signs, and how the dying spark of hope was fed, and how the breast was soothed, and how the head, and all his hourly varied anodynes. This for our wisest, and we others pine, and wish the long unhappy dream would end, and wave all claim to bliss, and try to bear with close-lipped patience for our only friend. Sad patience, too near neighbor to despair. But none has hope like thine. Thou through the fields and through the woods dost stray, roaming the countryside, a truant boy, nursing thy project in unclouded joy, and every doubt long blown by time away. O oh, born in days when wits were fresh and clear, and life ran gaily as the sparkling Thames, before this strange disease of modern life, with its sickery, its divided aims, its heads overtaxed, its palsied hearts, was rife. Fly hence, our contact fear. Still fly, plunge deeper in the bowering wood. Averse, as Dido did with gesture stern. From her false friend's approach in Hades' turn. Wave us away, and keep thy solitude. Still nursing the unconquerable hope, still clutching the inviolable shade, with a free, Onward impulse brushing through, by night, the silvered branches of the glade. Far on the forest skirts, where none pursue. On some mild pastoral slope. Emerge, and resting on the moonlit pales. Freshen thy flowers as in former years. With dew, or listen with enchanted ears. From the dark tingles, to the nightingales. But fly our paths, our feverish contact fly. For strong the infection of our mental strife, which, though it gives no bliss, yet spoils for rest. And we should win thee from thy own fair life, like us distracted, and like us unblessed. Soon, soon thy cheer would die. Thy hopes grow timorous, and unfix thy powers. And thy clear aims be cross and shifting made. And then thy glad perennial youth would fade. Fade and grow old at last, and die like ours. Then fly our greetings, fly our speech and smiles. As some grave Tyrian trader, from the sea, descried at sunrise an emerging prow, lifting the cool haired creepers stealthily, the fringes of a southward facing brow, among the Gianiles, and saw the merry Grecian coaster come, freighted with amber grapes and cayenne wine, green, bursting figs, and tunnies steeped in brine, and knew the intruders on his ancient home the young light-hearted masters of the waves, and snatched his rudder, and shook out more sail, and day and night held on indignantly, or the blue midland waters with the gale, betwixt the Syrts and soft Sicily, to where the Atlantic raves, outside the western straits, and unbent sails, there, where down cloudy cliffs, through sheets of foam, shy traffickers, the dark Iberians come, and on the beach undid his corded bales, Summary of the poem. The speaker of the scholar Gypsy describes a beautiful rural setting in the pastures, with the town of Oxford lying in the distance. He watches the shepherd and reapers working amongst the field, and then tells the shepherd that he will remain out there until sundown, enjoying the scenery and studying the towers of Oxford. All the while, he will keep his book beside him. His book tells the famous story by Joseph Glanville about an impoverished Oxford student, who leaves his studies to join a band of gypsies. Once he was immersed within their community, he learned the secrets of their trade. After a while, two of the scholar gypsies Oxford associates found him, and he told them about the traditional gypsy style of learning, which emphasizes powerful imagination. His plan was to remain with the gypsies until he learned everything he could, and then to tell their secrets to the world regularly interjecting his own wonder into the telling. 
The speaker continues the scholar Gypsy's story. Every once in a while, people would claim to have seen him in the Berkshire Moors. The speaker imagines him as a shadowy figure who is waiting for the spark from heaven, just like everyone else on earth is. The speaker even claims to have seen the scholar Gypsy himself once. Even though it has been over 200 years since, his story first resonated through the halls of Oxford. Despite that length of time, the speaker does not believe the scholar Gypsy could have died, since he had renounced the life of mortal man, including those things that wear men out to death. Repeated shocks, again, again, exhaust the energy of strongest souls. Having chosen to repudiate this style of life, the scholar Gypsy does not suffer from such shocks, but instead is free from the sick fatigue, the languid doubt. He has escaped the perils of modern life, which are slowly creeping up and destroying men. Like a strange disease, the speaker finishes by imploring that the scholar Gypsy avoid everyone who suffers from this disease, lest he become infected as well. The speaker finishes by imploring that the scholar Gypsy avoid everyone who suffers from this disease lest he become infected as well. Analysis of the poem Though this poem explores one of Arnold's signature themes like the depressing monotony and toil of modern life, it is unique in that it works through a narrative. There are in fact two levels of storytelling at work in the poem, that of the scholar Gypsy, and that of the speaker who is grappling with the ideas poised by that singular figure. Both levels of story relay the same message, the scholar Gypsy has transcended life by escaping modern life, as he usually does. Arnold here criticizes modern life as wearing down even the strongest of men. His choice of the word disease is telling, since it implies that this lifestyle is contagious. Even those who try to avoid modern life will eventually become infected. In this way, the poem makes a comment on the perils of conformity as other poems in this collection do. What make the scholar Gypsy so powerful is not only that he wishes to avoid modern life, many wish to do that. More importantly, he is willing to entirely repudiate normal society for the sake of his transcendence. There is a slightly pessimistic worldview implicit in that idea. Since it is clearly not possible to revel in true individuality and still be a part of society, the scholar Gypsy has had to turn his back entirely on Oxford, which represents learning and modernity here, in order to become this great figure. And yet the poem overall is much more optimistic than many of Arnold's works, precisely because it suggests that we can transcend if we are willing to pay that cost. For all his admiration, the speaker clearly has not yet mustered the strength to repudiate the world. The setting helps establish his contradictory feelings. The poem begins with images of peaceful, serene rural life, a place where men act as they always have. They have been untouched by the perils of modernity. Pastoral imagery has always been associated in poetry with a type of innocence and purity. Unfiltered humanity in touch with nature. The speaker is out in the field contemplating this type of life. The possibility of acting as the scholar Gypsy did. And yet he is also studying the Towers of Oxford, which, as mentioned above, represents the rapidly changing, strictly structured world that the scholar Gypsy renounced. And yet he is also studying the Towers of Oxford, which, as mentioned above, represents the rapidly changing, strictly structured world that the scholar Gypsy renounced. Arnold deftly expresses the speaker's split priorities through this juxtaposition. At the same time that he admires the scholar Gypsy, he cannot fully turn his back on the modern world. It is the same contradiction that plagues the speaker of a summer night. Thus, the poem overall represents Arnold's inner conflict. His desire to live a transcendent life but inability to totally eschew society. At this point in his life, Arnold felt pulled in different directions by the world's demands. He was trying to resist the infection of modernization. But it was creeping up on him nevertheless. And the pressure to conform was negatively affecting his poetry. Undoubtedly, Arnold wished he could escape in the way the scholar Gypsy did. However, he was too tied down by responsibilities to ever dream of doing so.